we're starting now. Off we go. Alvin okay. Marsden, great, great to see you. I can't believe I've dragged you away from the DIY. I expected to see you with a sort of like a, you know, a workman's belt and a couple of pliers and, and, and hammers hanging from your waist. I am wearing them, Rob, but you can only see me from the waist up, can't you? <laughs> what have you been doing then? All, all the hand Oh, I, I had a list of jobs to do. Uh, I didn't think I was going to be able to get them all done this summer, but um, I've got two left now. So uh, they're outside. Once they're done, I'm going to have to start coming in and talking to the missus. <laughs> but at what point do you open the first bottle of wine? Oh, we've got a rule. We've been very careful, but we've got a rule. Uh, seven o'clock. <laughs> I half expected you on the roof to be sort of hammering away and go, oh, that's it, I've had enough. Get, me, get that <laughs> bottle open. <laughs> no, no. It's a, it's a rocky road, that is. I bet there's a few people um, struggling with that one, Rob, because we do like a glass of wine in this house. Now, listen, um, uh, it's called the Old Footballers Club, so it's, it's about your career. Um, when you were, you were rejected by Everton, yeah, how did you end up at West Ham? Actually, um, well, I, some sad news. Um, a couple of weeks back, Rob, uh, the, the guy, a fellow called John McBride, who yeah. took me to West Ham, was responsible for getting me on the train and for everything that followed on. He passed away. That's um, sad. It was terrible lockdown. But he's a lovely man. John McBride, I actually got a picture there. I don't know if you can catch it there. But this is John. This is me arriving at West Ham at the old ground. Wow. Um, and this is John McBride here. And John was... Wow. Uh, he said he had a contact. I was playing for his team, a team called Nevin Boys. And he had a contact at West Ham and said, would you like to go and meet uh, Ron Greenwood? And I, I went, really? And I met Ron Greenwood in the Adelphi in Liverpool um, just, before, just before I was released or, or, or... I mean, I wasn't actually released at Everton. They, they signed the, the yes. Scottish centre-half yes. and the um, English centre-half in my age group. So I thought, I was a bit suspicious that they didn't fancy me anyway. To cut a long story short, John set that meeting up with Ron Greenwood and I went for a trial in the summer of uh, 1974 at Shadwell Heath and um, I, I did okay. I, I uh, marked a big centre forward called Clyde Best. Yeah, remember Clyde Best. And, and I did okay and they, they offered me an apprenticeship and, the, and that, is, that is myself and John turning up to sign that, that first professional contract at the age of 16. That's amazing. Were you, were you, were you a confident boy? Or you, I mean... It sounds funny today, but from Liverpool to, to the East End of London is like a billion miles in 1974, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, I, I would say I, I wasn't confident as, a, as a, a youngster, but I was confident when I was on the pitch. And I, 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 I didn't have anything, Rob. I had no alternative. I had to make it as a professional footballer. Otherwise, what else was I going to do? I had no qualifications at school, I had no trade. So I was desperate, um, and to be fair, from the moment I put pen to paper that day with John McBride in, in West Ham, I'd give it everything I, I had. Uh, went into digs in Cannon Town and Plasto, so all around the ground. Um, and then they were great years for me. You know, they, they were hard at times. I did get a bit homesick, uh, but, you know, there was only one thing I ever wanted to do. Did you cross over with Bobby Moore eventually, or, or just, just that before he went to Fulham? Well, that, that year, um, 1974, Bobby had left uh, a month before to go to Fulham. Right, right. And, 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 and it was a weird season because of the connections and the, the interwoven sort of history of careers and, and players. So Billy Bonds had taken over as captain. Um, and that year, we, the youth team, got to the FA Youth Cup final. Yeah. And the first team got to the FA Cup final, West Ham versus, who would you believe? Fulham, Captain Fulham. Bobby Moore. It's, it's incredible, really, an incredible story. So that first year was, was a great year to be around, you know, at West Ham and, and to be joining. And um, then obviously five years later, um, we got to the FA Cup final in 1980. But Bobby Moore, from the moment I walked into the ground, uh, I had a lot of luck. John Lyle was due to take over as manager. Ron Greenwood was a, a fantastic uh, manager who taught me so much. And then the first year that I got there, Ronnie Boyce had taken over as youth team coach. So everything that could have been good for me, Rob, was good for me. I had Ronnie Boyce, John Lyle, Ron Greenwood, and the West Ham team at that time, some great individuals, people like Billy Bonds and Frank Lampard and Trevor Bruggen. It was, a, it was a, I just can't remember um, ever not 
wanting to go into training. I loved every minute of it. Tell us about John Lyle. Uh, what did he mean to you? What was he like? Well, I, I always um, describe John as a second father. You know, me, me dad um, was up down here regular, followed my career. I used to get the mill train down, so influential in every way, me dad. But from the moment I came here, John, I think, believed in me. I, you know, I think every player needs, needs to know that people believe in him because you do doubt yourself at times. And when things aren't going well, that's when you need, you know, an arm around you. Ronnie Boyce was always uh, doing that, always asking me if I was okay in the digs, if I wanted to go and have a Sunday dinner with his family. And John, sort of, as soon as I started to get more involved with the first team, he used to drag me over a lot. So with there'd be three youth team players that would be dragged over to train with the first team. It was a big thing for us. And usually yeah. I was one of the three. So I always got an inkling that he fancied me. You know, as a player, and then um, from that point of view, you, you know, I, I, I never ever lost that all the way through. I he made me captain in 1984. Uh, no pressure was it taking over from, from Bobby Moore and Billy Bonds, you know, from the six, <laughs> you only had two captains, but uh, you know, that, that was that was a fantastic relationship I had with, with him as a manager. Um, who, who was the, uh, the, the, the best central defensive partner you played with? Well, for, for West Ham, Billy Bonds. Billy Bonds was, uh, was somebody I admired as a player. And I remember he used to play right back, central midfield. He could do everything. He could score goals. He could put his foot in, as everyone used to love him for at West Ham. But a tremendous leader, Rob. Uh, but when he actually dropped back to centre-half, I remember thinking to myself, I was only 18 then. I thought, oh, I'm never going to get the team with him there. But in the end, I ended up playing alongside Billy Bonds, somebody who I admired. I learned a lot from. Still see a lot of Billy now. Uh, it gave me a, a tremendous uh, amount of pride when they named uh, a stand after him at the, uh, yes. at, the, at the Olympic Stadium, the London Stadium. And I was able to host it on the pitch. A very emotional day. We walked around, there, there were 45, 50,000 West Ham fans, and I've never seen so many grown men crying as we did the lap of honour with Billy and his family. So it's, uh, it went from there, getting in the team, being captained by Billy Bonds, winning the FA Cup when I was there. Uh, was 21, all the way through to where I am now, and the connections are still there, Rob. That's fantastic, isn't it? It really is. I mean, I, I even got the, the hairs on my arms standing up when you're talking about Billy Bonds going, it, it really is. Um, what about your toughest opponent? God, there were a few of them. I mean, everybody used to have, um, in them days, that you know, the teams would have a big and a little in up front. So I would always take the big man. Bill would, would take the little one. Nine, nine times out of ten, I'd tack the first ball. But there were some big centre forwards uh, around then. Andy Gray uh, was a was a you know a fantastic player. Um, Graham Sharp, Peter Wood, you know they're they're, they're the ones that they, 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 they spring to mind. But that Liverpool side in the eighties was an unbelievable side. So I got on the team in nineteen seventy seven, and we got relegated that year. I played the last seven games. Then we came up in eighty one. And I suppose the early 80s is when we were playing some of our best football. It was a great West Ham team. Uh, and that Liverpool team with Kenny Dalglish and Ian Rushing was, uh, was one. It wasn't just them, Rob. It wasn't the two you were playing against up front. It was the service that they were getting. And if you played against them in Anfield, you couldn't go near them in the penalty box because there was a roar. And you, you always felt you were going to give a penalty away every time there was an attack. But some of the football that team played was, was majestic. And like I say, with people like Sooners and McDermott back in... Kenny and Ian Rush. It's fair, I think, and I'm not, I'm not being in any way uh, um, disrespectful here, but you weren't the quickest, were you? How did you deal with the likes? <laughs> How did you deal with the likes of Rushy and people like that? How do you do it? Well, I wasn't great at maths at school, Rob, right? But I come up with a cunning plan uh, in <laughs> knowledge. And that meant that I had to have at least a five yard start with anyone who was quick. And obviously people like Rushy was rapid, wasn't he? So it's all about really making sure that you know where the ball's going to be played before the attacker that you're playing against. And most of the time I got that right. Uh, but when I didn't get it right, I was hoping that Phil Parks was going to get me out of trouble. <laughs> well, um, what did it mean to you to, to play for England? And I, I think I'm right in saying, I was, I was looking at all the stats this morning. And you made your debut against Brazil, didn't you? With a team that had Zico, Adair and Socrates in. No press there then, Alf. That was unbelievable, Robert. The, uh, you know, the, 
the joining up is one thing, but then when you find out you're actually going to be playing against them, it's daunting and exciting at the same time, in like equal measure. And, uh, you know, it's not until the bell goes at Wembley and you're standing in the tunnel and you look at, like, Zico and Socrates and they're there and you go, oh, dear. <laughs> uh, they, they were a fantastic team. They, they, they were probably the best team I ever played against in, in all the years I played. And sometimes it was like chasing shadows. It was a bit unnerving. But they played with such flamboyancy. And it was like, it, yeah. it, was, like it was like Rooney playing when he was a kid. And when he got in the first team, he never lost the, the, the look of him just enjoying it for what it is. It's a game. And they all played with that philosophy. And it was, um, it was certainly an education that night. We lost the game 1-0. Peter With, as I remember, hit the post in the final minutes. We should have got a draw, really. And I think we were we, we walked off feeling that we give a good account of ourselves. Um, you missed out on the '82 World Cup, but played in '86, played against Paraguay. Was was that a pinnacle for you? Yeah, I think as an international, yeah, everyone wants to play in a World Cup. There's some great players who played for England and never played in World Cups. I think I think Viv went to two or three and never Viv Anderson never played in one. So he's a great player. So I think to go to a World Cup is a fantastic experience. But you know, you do want to play. You want to say I played at a World Cup. And it was um, in the first knockout phase. Um, we got through the group, scraped through the group, weren't playing well. But then we played Paraguay. Who, um, I remember seeing Dave Sexton uh, prior to the game. He was doing scouting for England in Mexico yeah. City. Uh, we played it in the Azteca Stadium. And um, Dave, I, got, I think we went into, uh, in to do some shopping and I got a taxi back with him. He was talking about them being one of the best attacking teams uh, in the competition. I remember thinking, blimey, you know, it's, it's going to be a, a, you know, one hell of a game. But the, the stadium, the heat in the stadium, uh, the occasion, the pressure of being a knockout game made it, you know, fantastic. It was, when the third goal went in, that's when I actually celebrated because I knew we, we were through. Gary Lineker was on the scene scoring goals. Glenn Hoddle, Peter Reid, Schiltz in behind us. I played alongside Terry Butcher. That was a good team. And uh, it was a team that played uh, Argentina in the following game. And I thought I was going to play, Rob. I know you're going to ask me about that. But Bobby Robson decided to bring Terry Fenwick back into the team. Uh, and he said that, you know, I'd been booked in the Paraguay game. And he had one eye on that. But obviously, I, I felt that I played really well in that game. And I and I'd flown my dad out for the game. Um, and I think my dad was more disappointed with me, than me, uh, you know, when I wasn't actually going to be playing against Maradona and Argentina. And we all know what happened in that game. I mean, that must have been a, that must have been a disappointment. I mean, you win 3-0. You, you're playing well. And you, you and Terry Butcher were obviously a terrific partnership together. It must have been a blow for you, Alvin. Yeah, well, I, I felt that the, the game had gone so well. And I think in, in the games that me and Terry played together, Rob, our, our record was very good. It was excellent. We didn't even see many goals. And in the build-up, even three or four days before the game, we were training at the stadium, I remember, pinging balls about me and Terry and having a bit of banter. I was convinced I was going to play. I just didn't see... Uh, where, where that came from. I didn't see a decision being made. And when we sat in the hotel prior to the game and the team was read out, he said, there's going to be one change. One change. And that, that was the only change. Uh, I'm going to bring Fenwick in for Martin. And uh, I looked along the line. A couple of lads looked at me as well. And, you know, I was, I was devastated, really devastated. But, uh, you know, I, look, I, I never, ever lost respect for Bobby Robson. Sir Bobby, he, was a, he, he made every decision for the, for the right reasons. Uh, and a lot was hard to take on that day. Then you quickly click into, right, OK, Argentina. This team's good enough to beat Argentina. But, you know, hopefully, there's going to be more, more opportunity for us all here. You know? So um, if it hadn't been for the hand of God, who knows what would have happened. But um, on, the, on the day, I, I've got to say, all I could say, I'm sitting next to Viv Anderson watching the game, thinking Maradona was on a different level to everyone. Mate. He was just, he was exceptional. It's, you know, I, I've seen him do things... Gary Stevens was probably the right back for, for us that, that day. He gave him a two-yard start and got the other side of him. And I thought, Gary's the quickest player in our squad. Now, how quick is yeah. Maradona? So, um, yeah. spectacular player. Um, and the second goal that he got, I suppose, really got us somewhere near for giving him all these years later. It's, it's Reedy's line, though. When people say, well, you, why couldn't you chase him back? He goes, yeah, but if I'd been on what he was on, I would have got him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they, look, I think Pink was struggling with the heat as well, and uh, I think I think Reedy had a couple of nibbles at him, didn't he? I think he come back to beat yeah. Reedy again, like you know. But um, 
hours. He was just a, look. Sometimes, mate, when people talk about great players, um, it's hard to put in a nutshell. But you, when you know what a great player is going to do, you still can't stop him doing it. Yeah, that is, that is you know the, the, the level that only very very few people on the planet get to. Uh, how how proud and and how big a moment and and where does it rate in the pantheon of West Ham appearances? Was the FA Cup win against Arsenal? I still think that look, it's forty years this year. It's the anniversary of that final. Frightening, um, frightening. They, they actually sent me something. Um, the club I picked it up. This came yesterday, Bob. It's uh, it, oh, yeah. you know, it's that team at Wembley, nineteen eighty. Um, and if you said to me it's going to be forty years and and running between. Doing something spectacular again, or winning a, a major trophy, West Ham. You know the size of club that West Ham is. I wouldn't believe you. So I still think no. that that resonates with me. Uh, yesterday we made some phone calls on behalf of the club to some of the uh, the oldest West Ham supporters, and uh, that's all they wanted to talk about. They were there that day, and yeah. so it's, it's still a big part of our history. So I'd have to say, Rob, as brilliant as the England experience was, the West Ham one. Is the big connection I've got with the, that 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 fan base, with people that, that that still harp on about that, and with that team as well because we were a very close knit team. Um, what age were you, Alvin? Because you're obviously, obviously very young. Did, did they, the classic question? Did you take it in, or did you have to look back at the tape sort of years later to go, oh, God, I forgot all that happened. Well. I was 21, Rob, when, when, when that day uh, happened. And uh, Bonzo, before the game, said, look, he'd been there five years before uh, when they beat Fulham. He said, stretch, just call me stretch. Take it all in. He said, the first time round, it, it, you don't take any of it in. Think about it, take it in. But I'll be honest with you, Rob. You're so nervous going to the game. You know, you're on a, on a coach. You're turning up at that old Wembley, that iconic stadium. And um, I'd been there in 1971 as a Liverpool supporter to support Liverpool. And we got beat that day. Charlie George, fantastic, famous goal. And uh, don't mind shedding a tear on the way back to Houston. And then all of a sudden, at 21, you know what, nine years later, I'm standing in the tunnel to walk out for a cup final myself against the team that beat my team. It's incredible. Some of the stories that, 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 that unwind. And, um, you know, it, that was a, you know, a very nervous moment. But once the game started, I, I didn't have any nerves. I felt... I was playing a game of football. Um, yeah. And then all of a sudden you're doing the lap of honour and you're running around and you're drinking milk with doing the interviews on TV and you think, is this really happening? Like, you know. But the, the, the biggest moment for me was the following day when you're, you're able to celebrate with thousands of people. You had thousands of people along the route and we were on the top of a coach and then we went to the town hall and I don't know how many people were there. I've never seen scenes like it, Rob. It was, it was tremendous. And, and that's the part you, you're not nervous about. You, you've done it. You've achieved it. You, you've done it. And you can just enjoy the moment. So I think as a player, as, a, as an individual, for me, family, and for the, the, you know, to, to be able to celebrate something like that, because it was a big day then. It's bigger than what it is now. Look, I think it's making a comeback, the FA Cup. But then, as you know, you know that, that era, that was a, a monumental um, competition. And winning the FA Cup was, was a big deal. Um, was it was the '86 team the best you played in at West Ham? No, no, the '86 team was a good team, uh, but I always say the '81 team, 1980-81 team, was a team that because Phil Parks was in the '86 team, but he was uh, what six years younger. Alan Devonshire was in the '86 team. He had a bad knee. He'd done it. He had a really bad knee oper operation in 1980-81. He was 100 percent, and he was a flyer. Trevor Root was in that team. He would have got the 86 team. Billy Bonds, Frank Lampard, they all would have gotten that team. So I always say it's close. And there are one, I think there's two players that would have a chance of getting in the 81 team. I never, ever divulge who they are. So I think sometimes that's <laughs> disrespectful, disrespectful to somebody that's been in the team that you've played with. So I think there are two players that might have got it in that team from the 86 team into the 80 team. Um. What about when you, you, I mean, it's incredible, 594 appearances. Um, I was looking at YouTube today, your last appearance against Sheffield Wednesday when Harry brought you on. How emotional, how emotional was that, knowing you were going to say goodbye? You know it's going to happen. Um, so I was aware of it, we were going to make a presentation at the end of the game. And um, 
he, he brought a young kid on. I don't know what happened to that kid. Um, Rio Ferdinand's name was, I think. Yeah, uh, hopeless. <laughs> <laughs> he ran out to be something, didn't he? But, uh, yeah, no, I, I think at the end of the game, um, that's when it hit me. I thought, I'm never going to be pulling a shirt on and playing here ever again. And that's all I've known since I left school. You know, I've, from the age of, well, just before my 16th birthday, all the way through to 37 years of age, you know, I didn't know anything else but that place. The weirdest thing, I think, was going to the training ground and pick, picking up your personal belongings. I had, like, some clippers and stuff, and I thought, oh, I'm walking out of here, I'm never going to be walking back again. Horrible. Wow. Horrible. I can imagine. I can imagine when you've done when you when you. It's like you. Well, it's like your home, isn't it? It's your home. Yeah, I, I, I've been. You know, I've made so many friendships. I've been so many connections. My family and uh, my kids were all West Ham supporters, and you know the the, the people Shirley in the canteen, Eddie the kit man, people that, that you knew really well at the ground. You turn up, and 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 it was never going to be the same. And I wasn't one of them sort of people that would continually visit the training ground or. Yeah. I, I thought I wanted to throw myself in there. And once I'd made the break, that was it for me. So it was, but look, I, I didn't know if I was going to miss the game or I was going to miss West Ham. I didn't know. No player knows how he's going to react. But you know what? I never looked back. I had a business that I was running, an office finishing business that fact, they'd been set up five years before that. I went and played a few months at Orient. Then I went into uh, working with some right scallies, you know, talk, uh, talk sport and it's, it's Sky. <laughs> <laughs> so I, just fell into, I fell into all that, Rob. You know, and I, you know how much I used to enjoy that working with you, and and then going to games and commentating on them. So the the the, 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 the crossover from playing to afterlife, as, as, as you may want to call it, it was easy for me. So um, yeah. I've enjoyed all of it. I've enjoyed all of it, and I've enjoyed the media stuff uh, nearly as much as I did playing. Um, I, I've got to ask you because. It, it is quite funny with, with a, the most astonishing career that you've had. But I guess one of the most famous moments, and when I saw it, I was, I was in tears, was, was when your David played for West Ham at Chelsea. I mean, I, I've got a 16-year-old son who's playing cricket, and I, I know the emotions that I go through. It was, it was just a perfect moment, wasn't it? it, it and it was, it was so spontaneous as well. Can you put into words what, what that meant to you? Well, sometimes, you know, well, people ask me, how did you end up at West Ham? How did you end up at West Ham? Like a scout said, like in the 70s. Like, I, I, it's, sometimes it is hard to explain. Um, but as soon as I walked into West Ham and I was around the club, I just knew it was the right club. It, it's one moment when it was, it was so clear that this is the club for me. And yeah. That day at Stamford Bridge, when I was there, in the dugout, just behind the tunnel, watching the warm warm up of, the, of Dave Dillon's warm up with the keeping coach Shabby. I remember I was nervous, and the crowd behind that goal, the West Ham crowd behind that goal, were already singing a song about him, and it, it, I found that overwhelming because they were they made it so easy for him. They knew what it meant to him. He was a West Ham supporter, and he made it, and he was one of them as far as I could see. And it was emotion before the game started. It was emotional. And um, that's the reason I joined that, that club, because, because they are special supporters. And um, th when the game starts, I thought, whatever happens, it happens. My biggest um, worry, Rob, was I knew how important it was to Dave. And I knew the way he was. He didn't want to let anyone down. He didn't want to let his teammates, the manager, the fans down, his family. And I think that was the overriding factor. Can't let anyone down. Can't let anyone down. So, of course, when it... The game unfolded and it was a crucial game and they won and then he, he, he went down emotionally. I, I you know, I went I was just so pleased, I was happy. But then I didn't expect him to do what he did. He knew where I was sitting and he started to walk up and I thought, Oh my god, he's gonna to come to me. And Adrian Durham at Talk Sport was sitting alongside me, a man who I've worked with for a lot of years, and me and Adrian yes. I was and uh, he come up, and when he got a yard away from me, I, uh, I, just, I couldn't hold it in anymore. Just said, I'm proud of you, and I realised I had to go. And, um, and I went, and it was a very emotional moment. But, you know, the, the response and the, the messages you get from people that, that you don't often hear from, but, you know, you're still close and you're still class as friends, you know, they, they were um, fabulous. But I, I walked over the bridge, um, over the Thames to get back to my car, and it was a lovely walk. 
and I phoned my mum, who's 88 now, and she was all emotional. And um, it's a day that the Martins will never forget, bro. That's brilliant, Alvin. Absolutely brilliant. Listen, can I just ask you a couple about the team now? Um, do you know what? It looks like there's a, there's a side in there to me. I've got to be honest with you, but I mean, I don't know if Moisey can galvanise them. He's obviously tightened it up a little bit. What, what's, what's your take on the, the hammers now? Well, look, none of us expected to be where we are. We all look, I know that when the players were coming into the season, they were thinking, can we have a little go and look up? You know, they're getting into near that top six. And Pellegrini, I've got a lot of respect for Robbie, trying to instill that sort of attitude in the players. But from, from the way go, things seemed to go against them. They didn't really get going. And you thought, oh, there was, a, there was a game against Crystal Palace that could have gone either way at the London Stadium. And from that moment on, it started to go a bit rocky. You know, and uh, Fabianski got injured. He was a great goalkeeper, Rob. You know, I know yeah. David's played with him and he, he knows how good he is. And, you know, that, that, I felt sorry for Roberto coming in. It didn't work out for him. And then you could see the confidence of the team was starting to go. Lanzini got injured just as he was starting to, to fire. Uh, Paul Lanny, who's a very good goal, uh, sorry, very, very good player, is, is somebody that was just struggling to need a little bit more time. Alaire, I know, is a good goalkeeper. He's a, he's a fantastic goal scorer. Sometimes the goal scorers, they need to hit the ground running. And he was yeah. struggling a little bit, you know. So things went wrong for them. And you know, in football, once you hit a slow, a slippery slope, it, it, it seems to be so quick that you start to lose your way. And that's what happened to them. Confidence went, and then you start to think, OK, well, they made a decision on the manager. David come in and then we made one step forward, two steps back. There were things that maybe you could have gone either way in certain games. So, look, I've got no doubt that uh, the, the team is capable of staying up. From this moment on, if we play the remainder of the season, I feel confident we'll be OK. But there was a time, you know, eight weeks before, seven weeks before the lockdown, when I was starting to get seriously worried as West Ham fan. Well, but I do yes. believe if when... Uh, the, the season resumes. We've got enough to think, yeah, we can regroup. The rest will maybe have done as well. David will have had time to spend a bit more time with the group. He will have been able to, I think, maybe come, and come in again and have a fresh run at it. Because I think he came in and there was an upturn, but the results didn't reflect it. And now that we've had a, 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 a pause again, I think that freshness between the players and the manager will reignite. So, I, you know, I think we'll we'll be okay. But look, it's been a tough season. And um, <laughs> in every respect, you know, we'll, we'll never forget this season, will we, for obvious reasons. But I think come the end of the season, um, if the games are played, I think that West Ham will still be a Premier League club and we've got to get stronger next year. You know, this team, this team has got the ability, but they've got to put that ability out on the pitch and use it. Alvin, as always, absolutely brilliant talking to you. Um, it's been too long. I'd love to, when this, this pandemic and this, this, this awful time is over, it'd be great to catch up and, uh, and have a, a little glass of wine, mate. And thanks, thanks very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. No problems, Rob. Look after yourself. Cheers, pal. Cheers.